Dr. Jerry Claremont went to Harvard Medical School and trained in surgery at Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, New York. After serving in the Navy in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska to care for Aleuts as well as other indigenous people, he moved to Shrewsbury with his wife, Anne, and their three children and practiced surgery until the 2000s. In 1979, they adopted two Korean siblings and later adopted four other Korean siblings. He later began an organization to bring needy children to Worcester for surgery and then began a project to travel to Guatemala to deliver health care. And he, in addition, began free clinics in the Worcester area, which continue even after his retirement. All right, well, let's talk about your um, experience with uh, immigrants and um, just give us a quick sketch of uh, your various, some details of your various projects and also of your family. Okay, uh, let's start first of all with the uh, adoptions. Uh, you had mentioned that we adopted uh, six from Korea totally mm -hmm. uh, and one from Guatemala. So we have a family of uh, 10. And uh, in fact, I gave a, uh, uh, an oration um, probably 25 years ago at the Worcester District on uh, specifically adoption mm -hmm. uh, and did deal a lot with international adoption. Um, but again, that uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, CHANGE, C-H-A-N-G-E, which stands for Children's Healthcare and Nutritional Goals Through Education. Uh, that was my 501c3, uh, and I had to do that in order for me to try to get supplies and to try to uh, uh, at least get some recognition uh, from the different companies to get stuff uh, for our trips. CHANGE did two things. It did number one. We had multiple, uh, multiple uh, uh, trips down to not just Guatemala, but also eventually Nicaragua and Ecuador. We took off roughly about uh, four to six trips a year. Uh, most of the ones that I took were all two-week trips. Uh, and I did two trips a year, um, personally. So you built an organization. You had a number of people who were working with you. A number of people, and uh, but we had very specific uh, rules that uh, we tried to follow. Uh, and I handed out sheets of these to all of the volunteers, uh, the medical volunteers who came with us uh, on all of the trips. And uh, we did, I think, uh, something like 60-something um, uh, trips total uh, during that time. So that was one aspect. The other aspect was uh, recycling. You know, way back uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, there was no recycling company out there. And so as soon as the expiration date arrived on any product, uh, they would throw it away. So I was collecting into huge trailer, trailer loads of stuff. And uh, I would take that stuff and I used what was called the Denton Amendment, uh, which allowed me to ship that stuff free on military transport to the country that I would uh, that I wish to send it to. So we we sent millions of dollars, basically worth of supplies to Guatemala that way. Uh, I also sent some to uh, to Haiti as well. Um, that's a whole story in itself, but. Um, that was the second aspect of change. The third aspect of change was that we brought children from all the different countries that we were in uh, to this area for surgery. Now, the greatest number of kids, and there were over 200 that we brought total uh, to this area, uh, and most of them were heart patients from Korea. In fact, 92 of all of the children that we brought were from the heart program in Korea. That was also done in conjunction with uh, Tommy Pisella, who was a, uh, a cardiac surgeon. Uh, he, in fact, back then in Korea, they had no cardiac surgeons. So he uh, took it upon himself to, uh, to teach uh, how to do cardiac surgery. And in fact, right now, 
uh, Korea has a very strong program in cardiac surgery. So 92 came from there, 40 came from Guatemala, where, where I did my work. Uh, I had about 12 from Ecuador. Um, we, we, in other words, we had children from all over the world. We had four from Albania. We had a number from Ethiopia. We, had, we really, it was an open door. That's because the hospitals here were willing to take the patients and the doctors were willing to take the patients free. Mm. That is not the case now, unfortunately. And in fact, that changed basically right around 1995, 96. That's when the hospitals did all their own recycling, got, got, uh, got some money back on, on all of the things that I used to take. Uh, and they also cut off all of these free freebies that we were doing. So I knew that the handwriting was on the wall and I said, well, okay, uh, let's, let's deal with some of the local stuff then. Let's, let's deal with, uh, with the immigrants and all in our area. So I worked with Paul Hart for a while down at the Epworth uh, Methodist Church in Worcester and uh, decided that, you know, there's a big need all over. So I, I talked to Paul and I said, listen, uh, I'm going to start my own program. If that's okay with you. And it was okay with him. So um, I uh, approached the St. Anne's Church and within three months, we had an area set up at St. Anne's, and uh, our very first day was September 10th, 1996, uh, when we opened the clinic. We had 20 people show up. Uh, back then, it was people who had lost their job or people who could not afford medications. Now, why, why the medications? Well, I, I want to mention this because uh, it is a big deal. Uh, I used to collect medications from people who no longer used them. They were perfectly in date. Then they felt terrible about not being able to use them. No one would take them back. Uh, there was no recycling program for medications back then. And so I took them. And I had a special uh, number of people at St. Anne's whose specific uh, purpose was to go through the medications, make sure they were what they were written on the label, get over all of the dates and all, put them into stock bottles, and we would give them out free to the patients. Now, a lot of people don't like that because it's not, uh, I guess, it's not against the law, but it's against regulations to do that sort of thing. Uh, and I still have people who, the day after the expiration date, they won't use a medication. That won't use, won't work it. So, at any rate, I gave out medications. Well, within three months' time, uh, we were up to about 50 to 60 patients every Tuesday night at St. Anne's. We, our biggest number actually was, uh, was uh, back in roughly about uh, 1993 or four. Uh, where, I'm sorry, uh, 2003 or four, uh, where we were up to 106 people that we saw uh, on that particular evening. Obviously, I didn't get home early on that night. Uh, but I also, at St. Anne's, we, gave, we not only gave out medications, but we also um, gave out immunizations. And that's been a big program. Uh, as far as the... Um, uh, immigrants go. Uh, initially, we didn't have any immigrants. That was for the first month or so. Once the word got out, we now, and, and, that, and Jane uh, alluded to that as well, they see a lot of Brazilians from the Marlboro, Framingham, uh, Hudson area. So I should mention that we for, uh, for quite a while, had several clinics. It wasn't just St. Anne's. Uh, on a Monday, I would go to what they call the Open Door Free Clinic that was in Hudson. It was in a Methodist church in Hudson. And there we saw a lot of the Brazilians there. Um, that went on for about 10 years. And then because of the lack of, uh, of nurses to help, we had to close that, that program. We also had a program, two programs actually, in Worcester. One was called the Aquaba, which was actually for Ghanaian population and for black population. 
that was uh, at a church as well. And uh, that, in fact, still is running. And uh, we also had another one at uh, uh, the Green Island Clinic, uh, which uh, ran for about, well, I say I ran it for about eight or nine years. And uh, it is still running, but not at Greenwood Street now. And now it's uh, over at East Mountain Street at a church there. So the Greenwood Clinic uh, was an excellent clinic. And it uh, catered to a lot of different people. Uh, I'd say probably 30% were immigrants. So um, those are the things that uh, came about as a result of my participation with change. Well, you know, there's two types of immigrants, really. And, and I'm not talking uh, documented and undocumented. I'm talking first undocumented. There's two different types. There's the ones who come up from Central and South America who have no skill, basically. And they come because this is, as far as they know, land of the free. They are able to do what they wanted to do, get something out of life, bring their families up here, have their kids get a decent education and all. Then there's the other type. These are the people who are, are generally relatives of people who have documentation, but they overstay their time because it is a great country. And, uh, you know, but they cannot get healthcare federally. They are not able to get Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, now that varies with states. Massachusetts is pretty good. We're, we're beginning to get many different things like licenses, et cetera, for undocumented people. Not all the states are like that, unfortunately. So uh, that is a big gripe of mine. These are people that we work with. These are human beings. We need to have uh, actually just follow our policies, which obviously they're not doing. Um, they may get overwhelmed, and I understand that. But we've got to have a better policy uh, control in this country. So that's my big gripe. <laughs>